Uh, this meeting is being sponsored by the International Socialist Organization. Um, so just to give uh, a brief intro, Chris is prof a professor at Pace University in the Department of Chemistry and Physical Science. Uh, he returned from Fukushima recently, uh, reporting for Counterpunch on the ongoing nuclear crisis there. He's the author of this book, Ecology and Socialism, Solutions to the Capitalist Ecological Crisis, uh, which is available on the table over there. And uh, he's also been active with Occupy Wall Street in the Environmental Solidarity Working Group. So, uh, my name's Pete, I'll be chairing this meeting. Uh, Chris is gonna talk for 45, and then we're gonna have a discussion. Um, and at, afterwards we'll have uh, room for uh, brief announcements. Uh, and on the way out, uh, please check out our solution, uh, our selection of literature. Uh, they're books for activists. So, cool. Uh, on the Q&A, are there people who would object to being video? Are there people who would object to being videoed? Great. Cool. All right. So, without further ado, uh, Chris Williams. All right. Uh, thanks very much, Peter. Um, so, thanks very much to everybody for coming. So, um, I'm not going to go through how desperate the environmental situation is. Probably people here, if you're in this room, you already have a pretty good idea of how terrible things are and um, rather than starting off with the as, as many environmental books do and, and talks start off with all of the reasons why the earth is failing and and um, how close we are to various different tipping points uh, I didn't think I wanted to go into that too much rather I wanted to spend some time talking about and analyzing why I think the system itself is ultimately at the root cause of the ecological crisis and why I think it's very hard or if not uh, impossible to be solely an environmentalist without also taking on social questions and uh, I think that's one of the things that the Occupy Wall Street movement has really brought to the fore forefront that it, this is really a question not just uh, of an ecological crisis but also a social and economic crisis and the two things are essentially mirror images of each other so uh, however Gina if you could just um, I couldn't resist uh, being somewhat depressing um, so <laughs> the uh, this the doomsday clock is something that was started by scientists after the the dropping of the atomic bombs who were in 1945 on Japan who were horrified about what that then led to and then the development after the atomic bombs of the hydrogen bomb thermonuclear weapons and increasing the scale of the potential devastation even further so they created and they produce a bulletin every year which has the doomsday clock as part of it and it moves either closer to midnight i.e. the extinction of the human race or further away depending on what is going on in the world and it's just been moved as you can see here to five minutes to midnight on the basis of two things one is climate change and the fact that the politicians uh, the world seems to be doing so little about it and secondly uh, on the issue of nuclear weapons and how that has come to the fore again and of course uh, since that uh, since this time we also learn that according to the times it was on the front page of the times today um, they actually had to consider the possibility of evacuating Tokyo as a result of the meltdowns at the Fukushima Daiichi nuclear power plants um, and Tokyo is 35 million people they were talking about evacuating 100 million people in total obviously totally utterly impossible um, and yet they were within a hair's breadth of evacuating all of the nuclear workers actually TEPCO the corporation was arguing that they all should be evacuated which would have le led to meltdowns not just at those nuclear plants but the surrounding nuclear plants too which would have cascaded into uh, tens of millions of people fleeing uh, and the irradiation of large sections of Japan and according to Yukio Adano um, who's the chief cabinet secretary at the time 
uh, said we would lose Fukushima Daiichi, then we would lose Tokai, that's another nuclear reactor. Uh, if that happened, it was only logical to conclude that we would also lose Tokyo itself. Uh, the, uh, one of the other um, people compiling the report, we barely avoided the worst case scenario, though the public didn't know it at the time. So this is due to uh, what has now been revealed, a secret report uh, commissioned by the Japanese government at the time when they didn't really know what was going to happen with uh, the reactors and how bad it would get. So in contrast to the idea that nuclear power is somehow safe or been made safer or we now ha know how to cope with it, uh, let alone its connection to nuclear weapons, let alone the question of what the hell are we going to do with the nuclear waste, this is, cannot possibly be any kind of answer to the climate crisis uh, and moving away from uh, fossil fuels. And you know, this is just outside of uh, Fukushima Daiichi, it's in Fukushima Prefecture, and this is what's left of one of the towns that I visited after, in December, after um, the tsunami. But one of the, if you go on to the next page, uh, this is a fisherman that I met, a uh, 54-year-old fisherman, and he's described, this is what's left of his house, he's actually describing how he was torn three kilometers inland by, by the tsunami, had his leg broken, barely survived, he lost five family members in, from the village that he lived in. But actually, uh, what's preventing him from continuing to be a fisherman is the fact that the sea around the area is now irradiated. And so even if he could fish, uh, nobody would buy the fish because nobody will buy food from any of that area now, the whole province. And so it's not just a question of what happened then, but the ramifications are going to go on for decades and decades. Um, or, you know, consider living, this is the foyer of an apartment building. These are all radiation readings, so uh, collected by the people who live in that area. And so even though this is outside of the evacuation zone, this is now the daily routine. High levels are, are ringed in red for how people have to prepare and come home and think about their children or if they're going to have children, if they're going to have their children go to school there, all these kind of questions. Um, and yet this is the kind of power that President Obama, nuclear power President Obama has just authorized the building of two new nuclear reactors in Georgia, the first to be constructed in the United States since uh, 1978. Um, and uh, you know, the, the energy bill that was trumpeted by some environmental groups uh, recently coming out of the Obama White House and what he said during his State of the Union. According to the New York Times, $27.2 billion budget request itself is mostly about nuclear energy. It calls for $7.6 billion for safe, secure stockpile of weapons. I don't know how you st safely and secure secure stockpiles of weapons, but anyway, nuclear weapons that is, 2.5 billion for non-proliferation efforts and 5.7 billion for, for the continuing struggle to clean up the environmental effects of weapons manufacturing dating back to the Manhattan Project. So uh, most of the energy uh, budget that was allocated is actually being sucked into the nuclear weapons and nuclear power program because they are so enormously uh, consuming in terms of financial resources. And what does that really mean? It translates to well, we can't have money for other uh, things, which means that wind power, solar power are always going to be too expensive because we never researched them. We never put the kind of money into them that they've been pouring into nuclear power for decades. <coughs> and so obviously in Japan, uh, I went to many, many different dem demonstrations and this is really awakening a feeling that n not only can they not trust the corporations, but they can't trust their own government. And so, uh, interestingly enough, much of the movement is also led by women. And so, this is generating, uh, creating a whole new generation of activists uh, led by women, which is also chan uh, challenging a lot of the gender assumptions in society, which is uh, really great. Of course, um, over here, all we hear about is the fact that uh, as long as things are not going too bad, then basically we'll be okay. Um, but uh, clearly there's a, a, a rather large problem with that outlook. Um, so what I want to do is, is put the question of why do they focus on nuclear power so much? Or why do they focus on, for example, uh, incentives f to fossil fuel production and tax breaks and so on globally in 2008 were uh, $850 billion. 
850 billion dollars around the world uh, incentivizing the production and use of fossil fuels. What could we do with that 850 billion if it was in instead diverted towards renewable en energy research uh, and so on and so forth. So, um, going back to the rather depressing statistics for, for a second, we clearly don't have much time, so it really is a question of how do we build a movement that will force change on the people who are clearly not open to any form of change, it seems. They're not even willing to let people peacefully camp out in downtown Manhattan, let alone larger questions of how do we get our energy or how do we transport ourselves around the country, even though we know that there are plenty of options with which to do that. So uh, I'm not going to give you too many more statistics, but uh, the, as, it's, as you see, can, can see there, the energy that we get from the sun uh, 101,000 terawatts every second or joules every second the amount that we use 15 and so we would only have to harness a tiny fraction of the energy coming from the Sun in order to completely power uh, all of our needs uh, of course that's not the only answer we wouldn't just do that but just to give you an example of what's possible uh, we would ha obviously have some kind of mix of wind solar geothermal energy conservation would mix would fit, fit into that uh, scheme very much so we waste most of the energy that we use fossil fuel plants for example waste about two-thirds of the energy that they so every every ton of coal that you burn about two-thirds does absolutely nothing useful except heat up the atmosphere and poison it uh, the same for car engines uh, the average efficiency of a car engine is about 25 percent so 75 every gallon that you put into a car about 75% of that, three quarters is just totally wasted, just goes to heating the atmosphere and producing uh, poisonous air. Um, so we definitely have answers. Uh, and yet we see from this that the amount that is spent on renewables is a tiny fraction, once again, of what they spend on nuclear power. So, but even with all of this money pouring for the last 60 years into these programs, specifically around nuclear power, uh, they still can't make it safe. Right? We've just had uh, one of the worst environmental and health catastrophes in the history of the world a year ago, and yet they still t continue to fund this insanity uh, when we have much cheaper options on the table. So it really raises the question, what are the priorities of, the, of a system that uh, has the capacity to produce these kind of accidents, but also uh, produces waste, radioactive waste, which is deadly for a quarter of a million years. So the, the US government is officially on record as saying that they are going to keep us protected from radioactive waste for a million years. One million years. <laughs> um, Homo sapiens as a species have only been around about 200,000 years. Uh, we've only had civilization for about 10,000 years living in towns. So um, obviously a totally ludicrous proposal and yet they put it out there as if it makes sense. Um, so there's clearly some larger thing going on that is not just about individual greedy corporations or CEOs uh, because we keep hearing about all of these accidents, uh, the BP oil spill, uh, the uh, coal mine disaster in, in, um, in West Virginia that killed 28 miners the same year as BP. Uh, many, many other uh, economic uh, and environmental disasters that keep happening. So how is this tied to the operation of the system? I think it's really important that we locate the cause of the problem because if we, if we mislocate the cause, then we look for all kinds of solutions which are put forward as the p possible answer and then maybe we believe some of those things and they lead us down a garden path towards thinking that we're doing something when we're really not. So I think it's really important that we locate the original source of the ecological crisis in order to then say, well, if that's the problem, what do we need to really address it? So I want to, I want to look at both of those uh, questions. And as you can see from this, I really think that uh, it is capitalism the problem. So why do I think that? Well, let me just uh, maybe start with a quote from uh, Marx from the Communist Manifesto. And I think that this was something that people can recognize as 
a realistic portrait of the world that we have inherited even though this was written 150 years ago so the bourgeoisie i.e. The, the one percent wherever it has got the upper hand has put an end to all feudal patriarchal idyllic relations it has pitilessly torn asunder the motley feudal ties that bound man to his natural superiors and has left remaining no other nexus between man and man than naked self-interest than callous cash payment it has drowned the most heavenly ecstasies of religious fervor of chivalrous enthusiasm of philistine sentimentalism in the icy water of religious of egotistical calculation it, it has resolved personal worth into exchange value and in place of the num numberless indefeasible chartered freedoms has set up that single unconscionable freedom free trade in one word for exploitation veiled by religious and political illusions it has substituted naked shameless direct brutal exploitation uh, Marx had a way with words um, the uh, the bourgeoisie has through its exploitation of the world market given a cosmopolitan character to production and consumption in every country all old established national industries have been destroyed or are daily being destroyed they are dislodged by new industries whose introduction bec becomes a life and death question for all civilized nations by industries that no longer work up indigenous raw material but raw material drawn from the remotest zones industries whose products are consumed not only at home but in every quarter of the globe in place of the old ones satisfied by the, by the productions of the country we find new ones requiring for their satisfaction the products of distant lands and climes in place of the old local and national seclusion and self-sufficiency we have intercourse in every direct direction universal interdependence of nations in other words what he's really describing there is neoliberalism and globalization uh, that what he was predicting would happen is the world that we now live in whereby free trade is the mantra uh, and we have to uh, expand everywhere over the planet capitalism constantly has to increase and expand and so what does that mean what it means is if we live under a system that is constantly expanding uh, you live on a finite planet then that forms a logical contradiction right you cannot have a system predicated on endless expansion if you've only got one planet to live on uh, capitalism exists uh, takes in more and more uh, natural resources and spits out the other side uh, waste products that's the only way in which capitalism views uh, the environment and uh, so that the fact that we have an expanding system economic system is in lo logical contradiction to ecological sanity and a stable biosphere uh, and you can see that from what, what how do we measure whether we're doing well as a country or any country how do they measure it in GDP uh, and expansion if, if the economy is not expanding at two or three percent every single year then what do we have well we have what we have now right uh, cuts to social programs unemployment layoffs foreclosures all of the things that we're experiencing when the economy is not expanding um, and so why is that what is it inherent into the system that gives it that expansive character well Marx analyzed that uh, and he said actually it's pretty simple you can explain that in three letters uh, what is the purpose of capitalism M C M prime you start with money as a capitalist capital and you turn it into a commodity C that commodity you sell but you have you sell it for more money than it cost you to make it M prime so you at, at the end of that process you've now got more money than you started with what are you going to do with it well you have to recycle it and turn it back into invest it in other words to use their language in expanding the forces of production making having more businesses expanding your business more factories etc and the cycle begins again and so capitalism is not about producing things at all it's the self-expansion of money uh, and that's why it's called capital right capitalism uh, and Donald Troutline the CEO of Bethlehem Steel put it pretty well when he said look I'm not in the business of making steel I'm in the business of making money uh, and that's exactly what the purpose of capitalism is how does it go about that purpose um, well it's it produces not for the things that we need there's plenty of things that we need that don't get produced in the, in the quantity that we need them 
uh, it produces things not for need but for exchange it produces things to sell because that's unless you sell your manufactured commodity you can't make money so they will only sell things after they manipulate the market the market through uh, all of the fixes and subsidies that they have and the marketing and the advertising and so on the the capitalists base what they produce on it, its exchange value not on its use value and so things that have a very high exchange value like weapons for example are produced in enormous quantities far more than we could ever use or anybody could ever use or would ever want to use for that matter um, and yet the things that we do need that maybe don't have enough uh, exchange value because maybe poor people need them uh, or other people without enough money to pay for them at a profitable rate need them are not produced in the required quantity so for example HIV medication there are millions of people who need that um, and yet we don't manufacture it in the required amount because those same people don't have the money to pay for it um, and so we have a system that is about making more and more money as fast as, as you can expanding production and these two things are in the service of profit and it's all done through competition all of the individual firms have to compete in order to sell more than the next firm so that they can then expand and not go under go bankrupt be bought out etc so that uh, process introduces a third contradiction for capitalism and the environment which is that uh, the short-term time horizon of the system there is no way first of all there's no planning that goes on under capitalism anyway it's complete anarchy uh, they are all producing as soon as they spot something that is profitable and is going to make a profit they all jump in expand production and try and make it as fast as possible so there's no uh, production plan uh, which means that we get overproduction of all kinds of things uh, and and which leads to another set of waste products um, but because of that overproduction uh, and the imperative to outcompete your fellow capitalists you uh, cannot look to the future and that kind of idea of looking forward and 10 years out 20 years out 50 years out is absolutely the imperative way that we need to look at it if we're act if we're going to have a sustainable society and so that in itself is a, is a further contradiction of uh, capitalism so between the the self-expansion the competition and the production for exchange and the short-term time horizon I think those three things rule out any kind of idea that we could have a green or a sustainable uh, capitalism in any kind of meaningful way and to you know what, what did Marx and Engels uh, you know there's there are reasons that, I, that I'm a, a socialist and would call myself a Marxist and what did Marx and Engels not that everything they said was great or perfect but what did they actually have to say about uh, environmental degradation and and why um, because we kind of have a pretty good idea about what how the capitalists view or capitalism as, as a philosophical uh, idea as an ideology view the environment basically it's a free store free source of raw materials and it's a free place to dump your waste back into unless they're regulated by laws of the government um, where did that idea come from well first of all if you want people to work into factories you have to start by forcing them in because who wants to go and work in a factory so the first thing on when capitalism is born what did they do they kicked us off the land the first thing they privatized is the land and so the enclosure acts and all the rest of it forced the peasantry into the towns to go and either you were faced we're faced with the same ch choice today we starve or we work for them uh, and so that uh, created the system you know Blake's vision hellish vision of the dark satanic mills of uh, emerging uh, 18th century 19th century England is the picture that we have of the privatization of the land so it, we are actually separated off from our ability to have any connection with the land because it's all owned uh, even if we try to have a small encampment somewhere uh, we find that's owned by somebody else too and we're not allowed there so the whole earth is has been privatized and that gives us uh, a way of looking at it that is separates us off uh, most environmentalists don't even use the word environment because it posits the idea that the environment is over here and we are as a human species outside of it which I would reject 
because we are as much part of the biosphere as any other uh, organism. Um, and how do we get back to that idea, I think, is a really important point because we are alienated not just from our workplace, not just from each other, but also from the land, from the earth, that uh, without it we would uh, obviously die. Um, so, uh, Marx and Engels analyzed this, and in a passage from uh, Engels that I was going to read, or I'm going to read, I think it underlines the short-term outlook that capitalism has as well as raises some really contemporary issues about deforestation and soil degradation and stuff like that. As long as the individual manufacturer or merchant sells a manufactured or purchased commodity with the usual coveted profit, he is satisfied and does not concern himself with what afterwards becomes of the commodity and its purchasers. The same thing applies to the natural effects of the same actions. What cared the Spanish planters in Cuba who burned down the forests on the slopes of the mountains and obtained from the ashes sufficient fertilizer for one generation of very highly profitable coffee trees. What cared they that the heavy tropical rainfall afterwards washed away the unprotected upper stratum of the soil, leaving behind only bare rock? In relation to nature, as to society, the present mode of production is predominantly concerned only about the immediate, the most tangible result. Um, and so, uh, how do we shift that and talk about some alternative way of viewing our place in the environment? Because it's pretty clear that what the system that we li live under, if we allow it to continue, will uh, make the planet, uh, remake the planet into a totally different uh, planet that many people and many species cannot live on. Uh, the current extinction rate is about 100 to 1,000 times greater than the geological statistical norm. In fact, we're wiping out species faster than we can find and classify them at the moment. Um, so how do we get around that? And oftentimes, um, you know, we're blamed. Consumers are blamed as the, the problem. You know, it's all our fault. We just buy too much stuff. Well, first of all, who was it who told us to buy too much stuff in the first place, right? You're not fully human unless you're shopping. Uh, under this present system. In fact, they've, ma they've managed to turn shopping into a leisure activity, right? Where we're supposed to feel more fully human and satisfied by the things that we can buy and the clothes that we can wear, and that defines you as a, a better or a worse human being or more fulfilled. Of course, it doesn't. You just feel an emptiness inside because that is not going to uh, bring you long-lasting happiness, even though we're told that uh, you know, if I just wear the right kind of deodorant or just the right pair of jeans, I'm going to be so incredibly sexy that it's just like unbelievable, <laughs> and it's going to transform my own opinion of myself or yourselves into uh, the opposite. So, uh, in contrast, you know, just to give you a few stats on on actually the biggest polluter on the planet, um, the U.S. military is the world's single largest polluter. It produces more hazardous waste than the five largest chemical companies combined. It's the single largest user of oil on the planet. There are only 35 countries that use more oil than the Pentagon does in a day. Um, 139 countries generate less carbon dioxide every year than current US operations in Iraq alone. So, just getting rid of the Pentagon which would have all other, many, many other kinds of good things, uh, apart from reductions in CO2, uh, would put us onto a vastly different track. And so I don't think you can really be an effective environmental activist without also being against the war, uh, and against the wars, and against the militarization of society. To quote Martin Luther King, from 1967 at Riverside Church, a nation that continues year after year to spend more money on military defense than, than on programs of social uplift is approaching spiritual death. And I think the only thing that we would add to that is that not only are we approaching spiritual death when we spend almost a trillion dollars a year on the Pentagon, uh, more than all of the other nation, nations in the world almost combined, uh, but uh, we're also uh, approaching ecological death too in many respects. Um, and so it's pretty urgent 
that obviously we do something about that. Um, because uh, if you actually divide up where all this money and wealth goes, uh, one of the great things about Occupy Wall Street is it's illustrated exactly where the money is. And we're constantly told we don't have enough money for schools, for healthcare, for the environment, and we're always conned into believing there's just no jobs. Unless we build the XL pipeline from the Canadian tar sands to Texas with that 6,000 jobs, according to TransCanada, the builder of the pipeline, 6,000 jobs only, unless we do that, there's just no jobs for anybody. In contrast, think of the number of jobs that we need doing that people could be productively employed in. In terms of, we need to double the number of teachers, we need to double the number of nurses, uh, we need to double the number of doctors, uh, we need to have, uh, how about some public transport uh, in this country? Uh, you know, New York is pretty unique in having uh, trains and buses in contrast to most of the rest of the country. Uh, the bridges are falling down. There are tons of things that we could be doing, and so that's why I would argue that this has got nothing to do with a, a, a technical question, right? It's purely a political and social issue, uh, the fact that we are not having these things. And uh, some of the corporations that make the most money uh, are, pay, um, are partly making that money because they pay absolutely nothing in taxes. But this is obscene. Um, these statistics and yet um, we're told that this is just uh, normal uh, everyday business. Nearly two-thirds of US corporations paid zero percent in US income taxes over a hundred billion uh, in revenue lost to the government or um, the some of the, the the five biggest corporations sorry four biggest corporate oil corporations this was their profits this is how many, in the same uh, time frame that they made that much money, that's how many jobs they cut between 2005 and 2010. Um, so, the more jobs you cut, the more money you make. Um, and that is uh, obviously an obscene contradiction for us to be living with when people are losing their homes, uh, losing their livelihoods. And uh, we have to ask ourselves, uh, in what same world uh, does this kind of statistic exist when at the same time we need people to be doing jobs that would actually transition us into a society that is actually sustainable um, or another way of seeing the same thing um, so or last year there's been a whole number of uh, food scandals over the last few years E. coli, um, tom bad tomatoes, spinach, any number of things, which is also linked to the way in which they now produce food. In fact, they've so poisoned the food supply that if you want to think about trying to be healthy or whatever, they've invented something for that too, right? As soon as they create a problem, they don't look at that problem, the capitalists, they just figure out another way of selling us stuff. And so now you can go and buy organic food because people are worried about the other food that they sell. They've made the other food so toxic. They never address the root cause of the problem because there's simply another way of making money. That's why they're so happy with inventing ethical consumerism or green consumerism, right? Because it's just another way to keep the uh, market expanding and keep us consuming. Um, the uh, the um, This was actually a quote from the New York Times in 2009 uh, they quoted Dr. Kenneth Peterson he's assistant administrator with the USDA's food safety, food safety and inspection service um, and they're asking him why don't you mandate testing for food because um, it's, it's voluntary by the corporations they could test the food they they could not they don't have to um, so why don't you mandate it because there's been all these food scandals people have died people have got sick uh, what's the deal? So he answered, I have, to look after, I have to look at the entire industry, not just what is best for public health. That's the assistant administrator with the USDA, uh, Department of Agriculture, Food Safety and Inspection Service. In other words, um, he's looking after the corporations before he looks at uh, the, uh, the people who eat the food, us. 
Um, and so, again, um, agriculture, the food supply, is possibly one of the most perverted and disgusting aspects of capitalism. The UN calculated, what would it take? There's about a billion people undernourished in the world uh, at the moment, out of, out of seven billion. What would it take to eradicate that situation so everybody at least got enough food to eat? According to the UN calculation, that would be $44 billion. A drop in the ocean to eradicate world hunger uh, and provide enough food for everybody to live. And in the 2008 food crisis, this again goes back to the exchange value versus use value, the 2008 food crisis when there were riots in over 30 countries, people in Haiti were mixing mud in and grass in with their food. Uh, it was a bumper year for food. Uh, there was enough food produced around the world to give every single person 3,000 calories a day, which would make everybody fat. Uh, why wasn't it given to the people? Because the people who were starving didn't have the money. And you can't just give stuff away under capitalism because your profits are going to supply and demand, your profits are going to go down. Um, and so, uh, as Marx, to quote Marx again, the dependence of the cultivation of particular agricultural products upon fluctuations of market prices and the continual changes in this cultivation with these price fluctuations, the whole spirit of capitalist production, which is directed toward the immediate gain of money, are in contradiction to agriculture, which has to minister to the entire range of permanent necessities of life required by the chain of successive generations. And I think that that's a, a great quote and a great way of seeing sustainability and our place in the, in the world. Um, we have to minister to the entire range of permanent necessities of life required by the chain of successive generations. In other words, we need to look several generations into the future to really see what our impact is going to be. And so, I think it's, as I said, I think it's really important to locate the real problem uh, with capitalism itself and how we view the environment because then we can st start talking about solutions. So then I want to I transition into solutions. But before I do, um, how does capitalism, from an ideological, philosophical perspective, uh, view the environment? And I think that this is important too. But like I was saying, uh, it basically views as, as something to be exploited, the same way that we're exploited, right? We're mirror images. The social world and the natural world to capitalism are mirror images of each other. Uh, both are exploited in the interests of a tiny number of 1% people in the interests of, of uh, making money. And Francis Bacon, was uh, one of the first scientists to kind of put this new perspective. We're moving away from feudalism, we're moving away from religion and uh, various different gods and ways of seeing the earth as kind of a holistic thing that we are part of. We're going to look at it in much more in terms of a mechanistic thing to be exploited and understood. Capitalism needs to understand the way the world works, needs science, uh, in order to exploit it. And how did, how did Francis Bacon uh, say that we should view uh, the earth. He said, um, and, uh, for a long time uh, the earth has been viewed as, as female, as nurturing, as, as, uh, as a human being. Uh, we still retain some of that language actually when you talk about veins of ore and things and the way the rivers run. It's all described in very circulatory kind of body language. Um, and uh, because everything comes from the earth that would make it natural that it was female. So lots of female goddesses and so on. So he uses that kind of language. I am come in very truth, Bacon declared, leading to you nature with all her children to bind her to your service and make her your slave. Um, in, in other words, this is now the new way in which we should view the earth because now we're, we're mechanistically going to uh, exploit and use it. He goes on, nature must be taken by the forelock. For the further disclosing of, of the secrets of nature, a man ought not make scruple of entering and penetrating into these holes and corners when the inquisition of truth is his whole object. And obviously the sexual objectification in that pa passage of the earth mirrors the sexual objectification of women, which was such a, a, a large part of life then and is clearly such a large part of life now. You only need to, to look at the, the daily news today to see JLo on the front and what was important about the Oscars was her dress, uh, uh, how little of it there was, uh, in comparison to you know, maybe what the films were about or something like that. Um, I don't know. Um, 
so uh, how do we how do we kind of overcome that? And uh, uh, I guess I'll, I'll I guess I'll go into that in a in a little while, um, because. If we put the, put the problem there, we're always offered basically three types of solution. The mainstream, the government, politicians, corporations, they give us three ways of dealing with the ecological crisis, all of which, happily for them, happen to leave capitalism untouched. So those three ways out of the, out of the problem are either technical, right? So we're gonna come up with some solution that is nuclear, or we're going to develop some new energy sources uh, we're going to bury the carbon dioxide under the, under the ground. We're going to put uh, mi millions of mirrors into space. Uh, that's a real proposal, by the way, um, to reflect sunlight back. Um, we're going to put iron filings in the ocean. We're going to shoot artillery shells full of sulfur into the atmosphere. Geoengineering. Uh, that's one way in which we're going to solve things. The second thing is we're going to have market-based solutions. So. The system that got us into the problem is going to get us out. Uh, we need more market stuff. Uh, in other words, cap and trade. Right? We want to extend the market into whole new areas. We're going to turn what was previously a pollutant, carbon dioxide, into something that we can buy and trade on the market. Um, that is uh, the third way, second way, that we're told we're going to solve the problem. Um, and then the third thing is, as I mentioned before, is really uh, personal lifestyle type changes. So as long as, because we're, if we're the problem as consumers, then it must be our lifestyle that we need to change. So we could change our, our light bulbs, we could do re some recycling, we could go vegan, uh, we could bike to work, and I'm not ag necessarily against any of those things. But you have to pay attention, I think, to what it's doing ideologically, because it's shifting the blame from the system to us. And secondly, is that really effective as a method of changing what's going on in the world? And clearly, I think uh, it clearly is not, right? I mean, there's no way. However much recycling and whatever else we all did, that's those statistics on the Pentagon, the Pentagon would still exist. The amount of waste under capitalism is enormous. Uh, the, and not just the, the waste that happens by the wayside, but the waste that they deliberately design into their products. Because it's not an accident that they break almost as soon as you use them. It's not an accident that they've got all this disposable stuff anymore and there's no repair shops or anything like that. They want you to keep consuming because the problem for capitalism is it's become so productive that we can't keep up with it as consumers. right? So we have to be convinced to keep consuming because there's just way too much stuff uh, around and uh, actually go go to the next one yeah um, and so as much as they complain you know just to underline it as much as they complain about China doing this and that and using up too much stuff and producing lots of pollution this is what they're telling them to do right um, because uh, without this kind of engine keeping going then there is a severe problem so we are not going to consume our way to ethical consumption, even though, you know, if you if you follow that road, you can end up in some fairly odd uh, places. Um, I think I was quote from uh, a book that came out last year: uh, "Eco sex, go between the sheets and make your love life sustainable." Um, so apparently, you can make your love life sustainable. Too, I'm all for sustainable loving. <laughs> I, I think that's a good concept by uh, Stephanie Weiss, and it's worth just quoting some from the back of the cover. Uh, leaving a smaller carbon footprint in the, be in the bedroom is easy with eco-sex. A green sex guide that will inspire both sexual and ecological excitement. <laughs> Renew your passion for the environment while you recharge your love life with green sex toys, low impact lingerie, fair, tr fair trade biodegradable condoms, bamboo bed linens, hand cranked vibrators, <laughs> conflict, -free, <laughs> conflict free diamonds and much more. Ecosex will help you avoid the sins of greenwashing while you probe the deep, deeper underpinnings of healthy, chemical-free sex. Um, yeah, um, I may not be as expert as I should be, perhaps, with the use of vibrators, but <laughs> hand crank vibrators do strike me as a contradiction in terms. Um, so uh, I think we need 
some better answers for for the problem. Um, yeah, well, I think that would be a better idea, um, I have to say, um, based on what I know about vibrators. Um, so what are we going to do about uh, the situation if we're not going to uh, go off and um, down a road that might be lead to some good loving, but is not going to actually change things the way that we want? And obviously, all of us, I think, have been tremendously inspired by the events in the Middle East. It completely changed what people thought was possible, that uh, democracy and a fight for a mass movement of millions of people in the Middle East and North Africa would transform global politics in such a stupendous way that it had people in Wis the Midwest, Wisconsin, uh, trying to learn Arabic for their signs so that they could stand in solidarity with the people of Egypt. And uh, obviously then gave rise to uh, the idea that maybe back in this country we didn't really have any real representation. Um, as people may have heard just yesterday, uh, the Obama administration, apart from being totally pro-nuclear, has now gone back on its decision to prevent the key, uh, Keystone XL uh, pipeline and uh, has basically okayed the start of it. Uh, where is it? Um, and uh, according to uh, White House spokesman Jay Carney, we support the company that TransCanada's interest in proceeding with this project, which will help the, uh, the bottleneck of oil in Cushing that has resulted in large part from increased domestic oil production. So uh, we're producing so much oil now they can't get it through, so we need more pipelines. We look forward to working with TransCanada to, can, Trans -Canada to ensure that it's built in a safe, responsible and timely manner and we commit to taking every step possible to extradite, expedite the necessary federal permits. So the idea that Obama or the Democrats are on our side clearly is no longer tenable and hasn't been tenable for a long time in my opinion. Um, and uh, you know, I think we need to learn the lesson that we need to be organized independently of uh, the Democrats and do our own stuff partly which was organized through Occupy Wall Street and other things, we need to get to uh, a position where we're saying we need to fight for some short-term reforms that are actually usable and good, such as stopping this pipeline. 10,000 people demonstrated outside the White House last year and created the initial uh, hesitancy from the Obama administration by putting pressure on, on them. Um, and we need to use it to say, well, what can we do now? How can we make sure that we shut down the pipeline completely? How can we make sure that uh, we shut down the coal mines, we shut down Indian Point, which is 25 miles away from here and 36 years old? Uh, the nuclear power station sits on two fault lines. Uh, they want to relicense it for another 20 years. Um, how can we do that? It's not stopping everything, but first of all, we need to buy some time, right? Because we're approaching some tipping points beyond which we'll lose our ability to control things. Uh, we also need to buy some time because we're not organized enough, quite frankly. We don't have the level of organization that existed in the late 1960s, for example, um, and we need to get there. So it's not just a question of being independent, having a set of politics that do not compromise with the uh, politicians and with the corporations, but it's also about building organization on the ground and saying that in many ways, the spirit of Occupy Wall Street, which galvanized hundreds of thousands of people all across the country and is overwhelmingly supported by massive, uh, you know, the, uh, the majority of people in, in the United States. How do we take that sentiment and start to organize it? Because I think what Occupy Wall Street has done has exposed the anger and bitterness of ordinary people to all of this exploitation of their lives, of their communities, of their children, of the environment. Uh, and said we need to do something about it. So ideologically, that's a huge victory. It's totally changed the narrative in the country. But in terms of practically, what have we won? Well, we haven't really changed very much so far. So we've won a huge ideological victory. We've changed the, the debate from talking about the debt ceiling and all that other nonsense and paying off the banks, right, who robbed us in the first place, uh, and started talking about we need jobs, we need to stop foreclosures, we need to take action. And so that's huge. 
uh, and it's changed mass consciousness. Now we need to be an independent, organized force that can take on the corporations and the politicians who they buy uh, in order to win some other uh, victories. Because how much money are they actually sitting on, the 1%? Let me give you some, this is my last round of stats, I think. Um, total wealth of the 1%, 65 trillion dollars. What could they buy with that 65 trillion dollars? Um, uh, sorry, t sorry, total US wealth is 65 trillion. The 1% have 21.9 trillion, sorry. Um, what could they pay for? All student loans for every single student in the US. All credit card debt for every single person in the US. Mortgage cover mortgage payments for every homeowner for two years. Rent for every tenant in the US for six years. All homes foreclosed in 2007, 2008. Annual salaries of 19 million families for one year. Give a $10,000 bonus to every worker in the United States. Triple the number of teachers and give each one a $30,000 raise. An extra six weeks of vacation for every worker for the next 10 years. Not one of those things, all of those things is what they could pay for. And then the 1% would still be obscenely rich and they would be left with, for their you know, little spending sprees and so on, four trillion dollars out of the 21. What would the four trillion pay for, you may ask? I'll tell you. <laughs> all of the following from American history, which are all figures adjusted for inflation. The Marshall Plan, the Louisiana Purchase, the Race to the Moon, the SNL Crisis, the Korean War, the New Deal, the Invasion of Iraq, the Vietnam War, NASA. Uh, could pay for all of those things. Um, so when they tell you that there's no money around for jobs or anything like that or saving the environment or any of these other things, it's absolute nonsense. What's that say? 50. Oh, sorry, thank you very much. Um, so, but I think uh, other than that, if we're not going to keep on fighting these uh, battles over and over again, um, I think that we need to really go beyond talking about reforms to the system and say, well, I want to link up the anti-war movement with the climate justice movement, with the anti-racist movement, with the anti-foreclosures movement. Uh, and I want to connect all those things, all those battles over jobs and houses and forms of oppression and say, really, uh, they are all linked to the same underlying economic and political system we know as capitalism. It is exploiting us and is it exploiting the earth. And we need a whole different way of viewing our relationship to each other because we don't even have any idea, none of us, what it means to be fully human. We're totally alienated from each other. We have no sense of what our own sexuality or gender is really about. And that's because we've been totally torn apart from each other. And as I mentioned at the beginning, there is no other nexus between humans than the cash nexus and the idea that we should exploit and oppress each other under this system which extends to the natural world just as much as it does to um, the social world. And uh, in contrast, how did Marx uh, see our place in nature? The life of the species, both in man and animals, consists physically in the fact that man, like the animal, lives on organic, inorganic nature, just as plants, animals, stones, air, light, etc constitute theoretically a part of human consciousness, partly as objects of natural science, partly as objects of art. His spiritual inorganic nature, spiritual nourishment, which he must first prepare to make palatable and digestible, so also in the realm of practice they constitute a part of human life and human activity. Physically man lives on, uh, only on these products of nature, where they appear in the form of food, heating, clothes, a dwelling, etc. The universality of man appears in practice precisely in the universality which makes all nature his inorganic body, both in as much as nature is his direct means of life and the material, the object, and the instrument of his life activity. That means man, uh, that, mean, that man's physical and spiritual life is linked to nature means simply that nature is linked to itself, for man is a part of nature. Uh, and I, so I think that is how we look at nature, not as something to be used and what can we get from it, and what can we do with it, and how much money can we make from it, but how can we investigate it and look at it for its own spiritual uh, beauty and the psychic uh, beauty and, and 
psychological things that it gives us just because it exists and we exist and we have some consciousness to appreciate it as a piece of art, as beauty, as things to be investigated purely for the sake of uh, our own enjoyment, not because we get anything tangible from it. And yet those moments, those moments, those rare moments that we look forward to in the brief time that we maybe are lucky enough to have some vacation and we can sit down and uh, watch the sunrise in the morning and be astounded at the intense natural beauty of the planet that we're so lucky to be a part of and alive on that is being ripped apart by uh, capitalism, those tiny moments would be actually all of our lives uh, if we lived sustainably, if we actually could think about in a long-term way what it means to, instead of living under a system that is based on competition uh, and profit, a lack of democracy and production for, uh, pr well, production for need, a lack of democracy and, and competition, those three things, that's how society is currently defined. What about if we lived alternatively under a society that was based on cooperation, real democracy, and producing things that we need instead of things that uh, we are forced to buy because they're profitable? That's the kind of world that I want to live in, and that's the kind of world that I want to fight for. Uh, and if you're interested in that, then um, we should talk. Um, but uh, for now, we should definitely talk about all of the things that came up, questions uh, and disagreements, debates, things that you want to talk about that uh, we can try and figure out together. Well, how do we really move forward from where we are to try and build a mass movement that can take on the people who, they're very tiny, right? We're lots of people. They're tiny. They're organized. That's the problem. Uh, the question is, how do we get organized? Thanks. Um, well, some of it is online. I have a website. Like the PowerPoint and stuff like that. Um, I could probably put it on my website, yeah. Just to be able to share with people and then sure. review information. Totally, yeah. Uh, what, what's your website? Ecologyandsocialism.org. And uh, some of the stats were in the book too, but yeah, I can put the other stuff online. You want to just answer them individually? Oh, sorry, no. No, no, either way. It's all, whatever, whatever you want. Okay, uh, Dave, and you feel free to raise your hand while other people are talking. So oh, oh, I meant Dave? that Dave, oh, sorry. Couple you're next Dave. <laughs> Dave? Oh, you have your hand up? Oh, this Dave, okay. You know, because we're so entrenched in uh, a capitalist society, how do you see like the shift from, uh, from private enterprise, you know, in its present state to a more equitable type of... Uh, management worker uh, relationship in the world. So it's something along that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> what? Um, so I might say something of more substance later, but uh, if you uh, kind of agree with Chris's conclusion about the need to link all of these struggles into a movement that for a whole different type of society that's based on need and sustainability and not profit, um, you should stay in touch with the International Socialist Organization, which hosted this meeting. Um, so I'm just going to pass around a sign-up sheet, and if you want to keep in touch with it, with us, um, put down your information. We have branches all over uh, New York City, so we can hook you up with one that's near you. Um, and I was also wondering if uh, Pete or someone else could pass around their hat. Um, we paid money to rent this room, and put on this meeting, so if you could throw in a few bucks, that'd be great. Uh, okay, so you want to come back? No. All right, so I have an empty stack. Uh, oh. Anyone else? Uh, Alex? Yeah, hi everyone. Uh, so I was at the anti-fracking rally on Saturday. Right. And I got into an extended conversation with someone who felt that there was just too many people in the world. And that we, that, you know, regardless of whether we could feed them or not, it, it was approaching a point where the, the whole earth couldn't, couldn't sustain it. Um, I'd just like to, you didn't get to touch on that um, in your talks. So I'd like to hear a little more on that. Do 
Yeah, I have a question about nuclear, and I, I apologize, I came in a bit late, so I might have missed a few of the directives. Uh, and recently, the Department of Energy has been working with the U.S. Department of Energy and the U.S. Recently, sort of cornered by a guy who was talking about small-scale nuclear and the incredible possibilities, and he was really using the language of sort of like local production and local control and local decision making and how uh, small-scale nuclear can really be a solution in communities for energy needs. And I mean, it comes off as complete snake oil, but I'm just wondering how you respond to that or how you... I didn't exactly know what to say to him, not being familiar with it at all as, as a, even a technological possibility, but I was wondering how you would respond to that. Can I ask some questions? Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I can respond to that and maybe the... I mean, people should feel... If there are any nuclear experts in the room or uh, people on human demographics mm -hmm. and, and population geography, you can also speak. Um, but just on the nuclear question, well, you know, We've just had maybe the worst nuclear accident the world has ever seen. And you know, after 60 years of development, it's still unsafe. And so what they're talking about now is, well, we'll just put one ev in everybody's backyard. And that'll, that'll, somehow, be, that'll somehow be better, right? Um, I, I think they're, they're, there are some, lots of technical problems. There's a reason that they build them huge plants. Uh, one of the other problems from an environmental perspective about building such a huge plant. It basically uh, forces people to use more electricity because it, once you put uh, a one gigawatt plant, a 1,000 megawatt plant, which is generally the size of a nuclear reactor, in a community, that's immediately massively enhanced how much energy you, you can supply. So you basically have no incentive to reduce your consumption. On top of that, if you also make the nuclear corporation not part of the state, but you privatize it, then of course, what is a, I mean, the insane thing about uh, the energy grid here is it's in private hands. It should be nationalized at the very least. Because if it's in private hands, what incentive do private corporations have to reduce your energy use? They obviously have the incentive the opposite way. The more energy you use, the more money they're going to make. So um, it should, and secondly, we know that they cut corners. The Japanese corporation, TEPCO, uh, or the nuclear industry in Japan, 80% of them are untrained day laborers working in the nuclear plants. And so they cut corners even on such a dangerous technology. So we certainly can't trust them. And, and I think they always come up. There's a problem with nuclear power, so they always come up with some answer. Now it's modular plants. In a little while, it's going to be thorium-based nuclear power. Um, but they're really, I mean, we have plenty of other answers. And if you want to really sustainably say, OK, there are small communities that we want to provide for, then there's easy ways of having small scale solar pa plants, panels on roofs, and, and geothermal uh, heating. Uh, there's also um, air cooling and heating uh, underground that can actually cool things in summer and heat things in winter just through passive uh, means, more or less. You can also re redesign the houses. I mean, basically, all the buildings in the United States are designed with, in order to need air conditioning, right? What happens if you design buildings so they did not need, if that was your primary concern, uh, air conditioning? We would have totally different houses, and they would be much nicer. Um, and we would use a lot less energy. Uh, the amount of energy consumed here is, we, we could easily reduce the amount of energy by 50%. Uh, in Japan, it's already 25% more efficient than here, uh, just from the way in which they design their buildings, and they've taken it a bit more seriously. Um, so, um, I mean, what, if we're looking at a different society, it really does mean, and your question about how do we move away, well, we would be completely redesigning the cities and the way in which we live and the transportation costs, uh, transportation systems, to look at rather than... Um, how much fossil fuels can we burn? Uh, how can we reduce that and use as little as possible? I'll talk about the too many people maybe in a bit, but. Um, so I just want to remind people, you know, feel free to raise your hand while someone else is talking and I'll uh, make a note. Um, Evan? Um, yeah, I just want to continue on uh, the problem with nuclear power. 
Um, it's not, you know, it, it, it's a false dichotomy to pit one polluting system against another to say that nuclear is worse than coal, no coal is worse than nuclear. No, that, uh, why do we have to choose which is least worst? This is like a U.S. election. <laughs> no, we could do better than that. Um, I think that we have to demand um, from uh, the people who are in power uh, to stop putting money into carbon uh, energy, like invading countries and occupying countries for the benefit of oil corporations or natural gas corporations, or to uh, put billions of dollars or tens of billions of dollars into the nuclear industry and, and, and really demand that that money go to develop infrastructure for safe, renewable, clean energy, uh, which the technologies exist now. Um, the, the other thing that people generally don't think about with regard to nuclear, which is the most dangerous uh, th uh, substances we have on Earth are nuclear uh, pollutants, um, is the mining of it is usually in Navajo land or indigenous lands in Africa or in Australia, and it's, they're terribly polluting. This is carbon pollution that's used to mine this and truck the uranium uh, for refining. Um, so, you know, so nuclear is not uh, a solution away from carbon emissions in the processing uh, from mining to, you know, to distributing it to getting rid of the waste. A lot of carbon pollutants uh, go into the atmosphere. Um, so, you know, it's time to demand uh, really something that we want rather than something that we want, that we don't want less than something else. Mm -hmm. uh, Stephanie? Yeah, um, I guess I want to, you know, so talk a little bit about the, the overall policy and the overpopulation question. Cause I, I think it's like an important one because it comes up so much. Like, um, basically, it's this like idea that comes from like the 19th century, a guy named Malthus who wrote about how uh, uh, you had, uh, he, you know, the way he put it is that uh, the population is expanding geometrically, <coughs> while like Earth's resources are only expanding arithmetically, and so therefore, you know, there's more people are, you know, populating, you know, more quickly than the resources, and we're going to run out of stuff. <coughs> uh, not based on any kind of empirical fact, but just this sort of his musings or whatever. So it, it, it's. Uh, it, it's it's wrong. I'm not only you know Chris already talked about the sort of the food issue that we already have enough food to feed everybody. We don't need to change anything, but it, it really applies to to everything. Uh, you know, you think about housing. Think about how many um, empty uh, buildings there are. All those like uh, fancy condos that never got filled. It's sort of like right before the you know recession hit, or empty office space, whatever. And then all these people who don't have homes. There's just you know in any category you talk about, there's a there's just the, the distribution is what's off, and uh, th there's no reason to think that we wouldn't be able to sort of keep up with production and things like that. There's also sort of a, a you know, a, a false um, uh, dichotomy between city and country. And Chris talked about, you know, uh, sort of people getting kicked off the land and pushed into cities. There's, there's no reason we can't have community gardens in cities and we can't have people living in places where there's no people living and evening. That thing, you know, those kind of things out would, would make a big difference. And I, I, but where this idea comes from is really an anti-working class idea, right? This, this idea that there's too many people. It's really a way of attacking working class people and saying it's it's, it's our fault, um, there's too many of us and we have too many needs. And I think that gets to the question that was asked at the, at the beginning, of, you know, toward the beginning of how can we, you know, how would we transition to a world that wouldn't be like that? We can't actually transition to a world that, that, that would be like this actually because of, the, of the profit motives that Chris talked about. But fortunately there are a whole lot of us, right? There's a reason they're scared of us and they have propaganda of like, you know, like this whole like we're, we're populating too quickly and so we're gonna ruin the earth. Um, there are a lot of working class people and. Uh, we, we actually we need to like seize control of um, pr production. Actually, seize control of uh, these corporations that are destroying the earth. And you know, it's a it's a bigger question than that. It's not a simple question, but uh, you know, it's not something we could just uh, ease into. But we'd actually have to uh, uh, take over and, and and have ordinary people uh, like those of us sitting in this room, those of us who just work for a living, uh, making the decisions so that we can make it in in a longer term. Uh, uh, perspective, um, which is uh, necessary for us and impossible for capitalists. Uh, Joe? <coughs> um, do you imagine uh, uh, a lot of employment happening 
in terms of our moving our productive machinery up up higher when the water comes <laughs> that uh, if if uh, ocean rises high enough we'll lose all our coastal cities and we should be moving our productive machinery up high um, you said in the blue coat yes What do you think the reason why both the um, the government and consumer is slowly or not even adopting uh, renewable energy compared to um, nuclear? I can't say. Okay. Yeah, you want to go? Yeah. Uh, yeah, I'm part of the International Social Organization. I'm one of the address the question too about the, the transition from that kind of capitalist mentality or capitalist sort of way of, of life to an alternative because I think it's I think around the environment that transition can actually feel the most daunting because you feel like what you're kind of up against is actually why people seek out these kind of very individual choices whether that's a light bulb or driving your bike to work it's not because people just want to consume more it's actually because the the state of the ecological crisis just feels so severe and there's not other solutions on offer, really. Um, actually, it wasn't really until I read Chris's book that I was like, oh, right, there actually are lots of <laughs> you know other kind of alternatives on offer, even in the here and now, um, other than this. But I feel like it feels very daunting. And I mean, one of the central kind of tenets of, of Marxism that I find very useful is this idea that our being determines our consciousness, so that the way that we live and experience the world kind of determines the way that we think about the world and think about each other. Um, and that, if you live in a world like we live in now, which is deeply alienating, we're in competition with each other, the n number of like racist and sexist ideas out there, has a severe impact on our ability to kind of collectively organize, our ability to actually kind of see each other, not as kind of separate you know, individuals, but part of the same um, community, society, um, environment, et cetera. But I think the times will occupy Wall Street and people's experiences with that, like you saw that begin to break down on a pretty tremendous scale. And so then people's experiences did determine a whole set of different ideas. So I felt like for the first time, like I went down to Zuccotti Park and especially in those first couple of months, it was like the idea that you could just, you just looked at people a little bit differently. Like you got in line and got your meal and it was free. And you know what I mean? You kind of sat down and talked to the person next to you. Like it, it those kinds of experiences collectively, the process of collectively changing the world actually drastically changes people's ideas about what's possible about other human beings, the rule of capital or the rule of that 1%, but actually through that process that tremendously change our ideas about the environment and the people um, around us. Eventually changing our ideas is not going to be enough. It's not like if we just have Zuccotti parks everywhere, right? You know, like the, the world would be a, a fundamentally different um, place, but I, cause I do think we need to use those spaces to actually challenge, challenge that rule. But I, I think that, that that process of actually changing the world, even in the here and now, will actually sow the seeds of what people, you know, raising people's expectations about kind of changing the whole, whole damn thing. Uh, I don't know who actually saw, um, did anyone see the Heartland Institute? Uh, they're a conservative think tank and their emails were leaked recently. Um, so it disclosed some of their funding and, you know, you see the usual suspects, you see the Koch brothers, but you also see there's one anonymous donor that's providing the majority of their funding. And they're using this money to pump out articles, you know, saying that global warming does not exist. Um, so you have the situation here, just to go off some of what Steph was saying, where one, uh, one rich individual has uh, almost an, uh, a, mag a megaphone voice over everyone else, over reason, over scientists, over the majority of people that are uh, feeling the effects of climate change and are, are deeply concerned about uh, it. So there's, uh, I think there is a population problem in this country and in this world. There's a, a population that's out of control and it's the 1%. <laughs> and the higher you go up the, the food chain, the, the carbon footprint increases. Um, uh, I read recently the richest uh, 500 million people in this world uh, produce half the world's pollution. So you can see uh, uh, the more bucks, uh, the more bang uh, you get, right? 
And so something Lenin said, or uh, to paraphrase something he said, was something, it was, uh, you must dream. And uh, reading Chris's book, you see a, an outline of what the world could be. And it's not just like in a wishy-washy way now, um, you know, oh, uh, cling to your dreams, but actually we must dream on this earth of creating a new world uh, or else our earth is going to uh, die. Yes, sir. Yes. Hi, my name is Mitchell. Hey. So, hey, Chris. So, I, I wanted to ask a different sort of question because I think most of us, I assume, are right in line with the critique of both capitalism and the ecological devastation that's going on. So, the question I had was the role of organized socialists, in particular groups or not, and the role of a mass movement like Occupy, which is not necessarily a socialist movement. So, so obviously one of the roles would be one of consciousness of, of raising these sort of this very uh, type of slideshow and talk that you did here. That that's one of the roles. But what is the role in terms of action? Um, I know I find myself in line with what the, one of the speakers were saying, that I found my own thoughts and the way I think changing just by participating, so that's important. Even the educator supposedly needs to be educated if that's the duality. But what is the role in terms of socialists in planning actions? Do we do actions? I mean, we definitely need to start hitting targets that are economic and eco ecologically related, and New York is full of them, right? Yeah. So. Do we do that on our own? Do we do that by waiting to try and convince large numbers of other people in Occupy, which might take a long time? Do we do it through more type of vanguardist approaches and hope that people will flood in behind us? I just could, I mean, these have been going on for years and years, these type of questions, but I was wondering what your thoughts are on that. Uh, so I have Stephanie followed by the gentleman in the wool sweater. I mean, sorry, not Steph, uh, Julie. Uh, so I have a comment and a question. Um, so I can recently sort of see more how uh, ecological struggles are going to be sort of part and parcel of a lot of the different directions that Occupy organizing is taking. So I recently got involved with some of the organizing around um, housing to occupy foreclosed homes, to do housing defense, eviction defense. Um, and so I was starting to look up uh, in, in and around East New York and in my neighborhood, East Flatbush, just trying to look up, you know, which, you know, houses in my neighborhood are being foreclosed and that type of thing. And I found this website. It was really to, to educate potential investors about, you know, the houses they may be able to turn a profit on. It's called Property Shark or one of these such things. But one of the things you can look at is pull up a map that shows all the, like, toxic waste sites in your neighborhood. <laughs> like, everything from, like, big gas spills to, like, brown feet. I, I mean, I didn't know half the words, to be honest. It made me want to within a couple blocks of my house, there was all these different dots on this map of varying sizes and shapes that I had never seen before. Like, they want investors to know about this. But I think that it just called my attention to the reality that if we're, if we're take, beginning to sort of take over our homes and assert that we have the right to live in them and fix them up on our terms, uh, whether we own them or don't own them or, or whatever, but that housing is human right. But then it's like, what about our neighborhoods? If there's like toxic waste being <laughs> dumped in our neighborhood, but we, we figured out how to drywall and get rid of the mold in the, in the building, it doesn't actually create a, a healthy living situation if there's still <laughs> toxic waste in the neighborhoods. <laughs> and honestly, like I, I, I do think that like, if we can begin to figure out how to defend one family from eviction, there's a much more confident basis to sort of begin to look at how do we, what are the other aspects of what we can do to create a, a healthy and, and livable sort of situation for ourselves. But I'm also interested in, in things other people know about now or historically, um, ways in which like the ecological issues, obviously they're interwoven with everything, but to be honest, because we are so alienated from things, I don't usually think of it like that. Uh, and so if people know of other struggles, I'd be interested to hear more about that. And I think all of us in here, are, most people generally would agree that the system doesn't work. You know, unless you are that one percent profiting <laughs> immensely from it. Um, you know, without a utopian uh, view of the world, wh what is the alternative? How do you move away from capitalism? I mean, I totally get how it creates, um, you know, a false uh, scarcity in the world. 
Um, but, you know, nevertheless, that does exist, especially in the beginning, once you shift away. You know, you have 7 billion people on the planet, some of them living in a desert. We're all um, interdependent upon one of, uh, you know, on each other, you know, not just the environment. You know, how do you get somebody to bring water to the desert? You know, how do you, how do you um, handle that? What's the alternative? I, um, I think it's a great question, and maybe I can combine it uh, with Mitchell's too, possibly. Um, I mean, I, I think that the first thing to say is that if there's one thing that defines humans as a species, it's our resistance to tyranny and oppression. People have always fought back when and revolted against inequality and injustice throughout human history. There is that thread uh, running through it. And actually, for the vast majority of us existing on this planet as a species, 200,000 years, um, most of that period of time, we were hunter-gatherers cooperating in small bands. So we didn't know anything about exploitation and oppression. Everybody was just doing things for each other. Otherwise, everybody died if you didn't cooperate. And so it's a totally different way of organizing ourselves. It's only in about the last 10,000 years or so, since you have uh, the division between town and country, settled communities, you get a division of labor between the exploiters and the exploited, and that can take different forms, uh, slaves and slaveholders, or lords and peasants, or workers and bosses. Um, but nevertheless, it's an exploitative and oppressive relationship. And for all of that period of time, people have fought against it um, throughout history. So when people talk about human nature being greedy or whatever, actually, I don't agree with that. And it doesn't stand up to a scientific analysis. Most of the time, we've cooperated and shared stuff, actually, because that's how we stayed alive. And that's how we evolved. We're a social species. We can't survive on our own. If anything's warped our thinking on that, it is this competitive system that has turned greed into an asset, right? What would previously been seen as a social negative, and you would have been ostracized or thrown out of your community for that, uh, is now seen as, you know, greed is good. Uh, so, um, you know, that, that's the first thing. I think that whether socialists are around or not, people will fight back. And we see that over and over again. Look, just look at the Middle East uh, over the last year or so. Um, so, but I think that in terms of how do we move from this system to something else? Well, first of all, I want to see a revolution, right? This system <laughs> has not been around that long. It's pretty short-lived. How long has capitalism been around, right? We've, uh, there was slavery, old world slavery and new world slavery. There was feudalism for a few hundred years. And now we have capitalism for the last, what? 250, maybe 300 years, depends when you want to date it from, but it's pretty new. Um, and only in the last 50 or 60 years has it gone on to you know, steroids and been hyped up to the max through, in, particularly in the last 30 years, neoliberalism. Um, how do we get rid of it? It's the same way we've got rid of feudalism before or slavery before that, uh, essentially through uh, the mm -hmm. creation of mass movements. Mm -hmm. and. How did the 60s start? Or where did they start? Well, they started with, you know, you could date it to a number of different periods of time. But you could certainly date, date it to the Mon Montgomery bus boycott, which is uh, one woman deciding that she wasn't going to move to the back of the bus anymore. And that caught on in the same way that Occupy Wall Street was a few people that sparked a mass movement because the time was ripe, that th those conditions People felt genuinely connected to that as a thing. So the Mon Mon Montgomery bus boycott went on for a year. 50,000 African Americans refusing to take public transport for an entire year uh, to win that, which is actually a small thing in many respects. And actually, the movement then dies. Nothing happens then for a while, really until 1960. Uh, and then it changes. Different tactics are called for because the old tactics wouldn't work. So they tried something new. Uh, they tried the sit in. And so for, for young students, African-American students, go and sit in uh, in North Carolina. And that then sparks a new movement.
But then there are all kinds of questions about whether it will work and whether it will work or not, whether it will work or not. There's massive amounts of repression, beatings, people are shot and killed, uh, tortured by the police. Um, the, the, the national government doesn't do anything about it. The tactics change again uh, a couple of years later to the freedom rights. And that draws in people from the north and it creates a bigger movement and they found something else. Uh, and, then, and then there's another lull, but it also starts connecting with the Vietnam War movement and the civil rights struggle connects up and starts to generalize people's anger against the system into an anti-war movement. And uh, people start seeing the connections and the movement radicalizes and says, we're not just talking about the 1964 Civil Rights Act or the 1965 Voting Rights Act, we're talking about full equality. We're not satisfied with these things anymore. And we're, we're going to form a liberation movement. Uh, and that leads into the Black Power Movement. Uh, and then the rise in struggle up through 1968, the assassination of Martin Luther King and the urban rebellions, uh, that then starts to feed into wider questions. Why are women oppressed and treated? You know, in all the, these activist movements, the only thing women were doing was doing the photocopying uh, and fetching the tea and coffee. And suddenly they realized, what the hell are we doing never having a say in this movement? Why are we never at the front speaking? Uh, why we, our opinions don't count for anything? So they started organizing. And then that actually generalized into the environmental movement and created the modern environmental movement. So the first Earth Day in 1970, uh, 20 million Americans were on the streets. 20 million saying, and it was all anti-corporate. Anti no corporations allowed because people saw they were the problem. Uh, of course, Earth Day now, we need to reclaim it because it's sponsored by Coca-Cola and you know all of this stuff because they're all green corporations now. So we've lost a lot uh, as they forced us back over the last 30 years in many, many ways. So you know, I think it's important to remember that movements go up and down and have to rearrange how they organize. And what, what can seem like it disappearing like Occupy Wall Street hasn't disappeared because the conditions that produced it in the first place all still exist. And so uh, what I want to try and be part of I mean, I've been an activist since I was, just to give a little bit of background, I've been an activist since I was 15. I joined my first political organization then. Uh, it was the African National Congress. I, I didn't really know anything about politics, but it seemed odd to me that black people couldn't vote in their own country. And then as I found out more about it, it seemed even more odd and something that was just so unfair, I had to do something about it. Uh, so I got involved in, in the ANC. Uh, that was the first organization that I joined. But then I also joined CND, Campaign for Nuclear Disarmament, because I was like, nuclear weapons? What the hell is that? Um, and, but, but then, uh, you know, nuclear weapons and South Africa and all of the other things that were going on in the world in, in the 1980s with Ronald Reagan and Margaret Thatcher all seemed connected. And that's what made me a socialist. And so people will revolt. I think the role of socialists is to say, well, these things all come under the same common cause and sa same, same problem, and we need to link them up into a mass movement. The only force that is really capable of making a difference is the people who work, all of us. Because if we don't work, I don't know how many people remember the transit strike from a few years ago in this city. Within two days, the city was on its knees because 35,000 black and Latino workers refused to drive people around and get people to work. Seven million people couldn't go back and to their workplaces. Uh, food was starting to run out by the third day. There was so much pressure. If they'd held out for another couple of days, they would have won everything and transformed the environment in this country. Uh, that was an amazing struggle. Unfortunately, we lost. Uh, but that gives just a hint of what is possible, I think, when we organize and we, we say, OK, we're not going to work. I mean, really, who does all the driving? Who operates the factories? Who goes to the businesses? It's us. Right? They don't do it. They don't do anything. They rob us. So uh, you know, I think in some ways it's hard to see, because I'm pointing to a historical example. But after Egypt, who can say what is not possible? I know that there, it's in a lull, and there's lots of questions about, from the Egyptians about how do we move forward. The military is over here. There are splits and divisions. But nevertheless, the people there have been empowered to change their ideas about what is possible for 30 years. They lived under the most horrendous dictatorship. People being murdered and killed, small groups of people uh, meeting in a room much smaller than this, 
they're arrested, beaten, tortured, killed. A few years later, another small group, same thing, until eventually, 2011, they get rid of Mubarak, they get rid of the military, they're in a different country. And that's changed their ideas about what's possible. So um, I think that you know, looking at Occupy Wall Street on a smaller scale, we can see the potential and the anger that exists on the ground. The question is, how do we organize it? And that, again, brings me back to the role of, I think, socialists and an organization, because we need to try and connect not just what's going on in New York City, but what's going on in LA and Chicago, and make sure that we are aiming our anger at the right people, because they try and distract us. Where does racism come from? Where does sexism or homophobia come from? Who benefits from those things, really? If we're fighting each other, then we forget about the people who instituted those ideas in the first place. Uh, and so when you look at the history of racism in this, there's, there's nothing you can explain about the United States without talking about racism and the centrality of, that, uh, of the, the African-American experience and question in, in the United States. It's impossible. Um, and why is it such a central question? Because they've made it so. Because they instituted laws to make sure that black and white people were physically kept separated. I mean, if, if, they hated, if we hated each other so much, black and white people, why did they have to have laws to stop us from marrying? Why did they have to have laws to make sure that we didn't drink from the same place or go to the same bathroom or use the same blood banks? Because people did get together, because they actually saw their class interests as poor people as more important than the color lines between them. So actually, some people do, dem do uh, benefit from those things, and it's not us. And so how do we overcome those things? Um, I think is a tremendously important question. That's another reason for linking all these struggles together. I think that's uh, a role that socialists can play in terms of generalizing from, I don't just want to talk about environmental questions. I want to talk about all of them. And so movements will exist, whether socialists are around or not. I think the role of an organized socialist like myself is to say we need to be in a bigger organization. We need to draw in working people and form communities of resistance everywhere in the country to say, if we don't work, nothing happens. We are the power. We just don't realize it yet. Ultimately, what I want to see is another revolution. There have already been two revolutions in this country, right? Uh, kicking out the British and then the Civil War. Um, so how can we have a third one, right? It's not like it's never happened before. And how can we have a third one that puts us in power, where the vast majority take the, in, the, the decisions in the interests of the vast majority? Uh, you know, what would New York City look like, look like if we were the ones making the decisions? This city's not even made for us. We, you can barely cross the street without taking your life into your hands. What would this city look like if we got rid of cars? 